Sprint training can be categorised as either primary methods, which involves traditional sprinting or technical drills without the use of any external load, or secondary methods, which involve sprinting that is modified with assistance or resistance, and tertiary methods, which includes non-specific methods such as strength and power training. When focusing on secondary sprint training methods, means of achieving resisted sprint training to provide an external overload without causing large changes to sprint technique can include the use of parachutes, sleds or uphill sprinting to name a few, whereas means of implementing assisted sprint training to allow an increase in velocity to be achieved artificially without causing large changes to sprint technique can include the use of bands and motorised cables while sprinting or running downhill. A training strategy using both assisted and resisted forms of sprinting involves sprinting both up and down artificial or natural hills or slopes within a single repetition to impose an increase in load and velocity, known as combined uphill downhill sprinting. To determine the effects of combined uphill downhill sprinting versus resisted sprinting methods on sprint performance, Hamad and colleagues recently conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis. This presentation, brought to you by Talking Sports Science, will be a summary of their research. First of all, regarding the inclusion criteria, studies were only included in analysis if they involved healthy participants that had completed sprinting up and downhill within a single repetition on any surface with a slope of one degree or above or completed a resisted sprint training program using sleds, bands, cables, weighted vests, or uphill, performed at least once per week, for four weeks or more, and involved maximum sprinting over any distance, with pre- and post-training sprint performance being measured using an automated device, for example using timing gates. Lastly, any change in sprint performance from baseline to post-intervention need to have been compared to a control group, that performed traditional sprinting. In the end, 22 studies met the criteria, from which 24 eligible groups were used in the analysis. Regarding the study characteristics, the most common resisted sprint training method was sled sprinting, with sled loads being prescribed as either percentage of velocity loss, percentage of body mass, or absolute loads. Regarding the six studies involving combined uphill-downhill sprinting, Five studies all used the same platform dimensions with a three degree slope, while one study used slightly different platform dimensions and a four degree slope. Regarding test distances, 30 and 35 metres were the most frequently used for resisted sprint training and combined uphill downhill sprinting respectively. And regarding total training programme volumes, resisted sprint training programmes on average sprinted nearly 3,000 metres, while combined uphill-downhill sprinting achieved on average nearly 10,000 metres. This difference in total volume, in part, is because the combined uphill-downhill sprinting groups sprinted nearly 80 metres per sprint, which led to a greater accumulation of distances across sessions and weeks. Also, the increased demand of towing weighted sleds may have limited how much volume could be prescribed. Therefore, Sessional training efficacy was calculated to normalise performance changes against training volume. Each study's training programme can be found in Table 6 and 7 of the Electronic Supplementary Information, the link to which can be found in the video description. Moving on to the findings, combined uphill-downhill sprinting and resisted sprinting methods both significantly improve sprint performance. However, combined uphill-downhill sprinting showed significantly greater improvements in sprint performance compared with traditional sprinting, while resisted sprinting, although appearing more effective at distances less than 20 metres, showed no difference when compared with traditional sprinting. One possible reason why might be related to the load-velocity stimuli of each training method. During a sprint, the force-velocity demands have an inverse relationship. From a stationary start, Sprint speed gradually increases before plateauing once maximum velocity is reached. Conversely, the mean propulsive force produced is highest at the beginning of a sprint, i.e. the acceleration phase, when sufficient force must be generated to overcome inertia and accelerate forward. But this then steadily decreases 
as factors such as ground contact time decrease. This then may explain why resisted sprint training show greater effectiveness at improving the acceleration phase, while assisted sprinting may enhance the maximum velocity phase. Therefore, it's possible that a combined uphill-downhill sprint training program may expose an individual to a broader load velocity spectrum than resisted sprinting alone. However, as mentioned earlier, only six combined uphill-downhill sprint training programs were included in the review, compared to 16 resisted sprint training studies, which limited the analysis that could be done. For example, combined uphill-downhill sprinting did not possess any data for sprint distances below 35 metres, so it's unclear how this training method impacts early acceleration performance. Furthermore, the majority of the individuals in the combined uphill-downhill sprinting studies involve non-competing participants, whereas most of the individuals in the resisted sprint groups did compete in different sports. Therefore, because those who are at a lower level experience greater improvements in sprint performance compared to higher trained individuals, this likely causes disparity between the observed effects from the two sprint training approaches. This further highlights the need for future investigations into combined uphill-downhill sprinting studies with trained athletes over longer training periods, using a range of pre- and post-sprint test distance measures, as well as investigations into the optimal hill gradient. And that concludes this presentation. I recommend you go and check out the full article to see for yourself the nuances between the training studies included in the review. The link to the article is in the description. Thanks for listening, folks. See you next time.